Great, Connie. Thanks. Uh, and welcome to all the people that are uh, taking part in the program today. We look forward to a really engaging uh, uh, session. And I think the choice of topics and speakers, I think you'll agree at the end, uh, has been has been really uh, well considered. Uh, and the first speaker uh, today uh, is Dr. Baba Feme uh, Taiwo. Uh, he is a professor of medicine and head of infectious diseases uh, at Northwestern University. Uh, this course used to be based in Chicago. We'll pretend we're still there. So I'll say here in Chicago, um, here is Dr. Uh, Taiwo. So uh, welcome uh, to the program. And once we get the uh, slides uh, figured out, we'll uh, we'll get launched. So uh, we'll, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Taiwo about uh, investigational new drugs. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a really active process of developing new drugs and new ways of thinking about how we might use those along with the ones we currently have. So welcome to the program, Baba Femi. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. I would like to welcome uh, all our uh, listeners. Uh, here are my financial relationships and the learning objectives are stated here. We will, uh, at the end of this presentation, learners should be able to discuss investigational uh, ARV agents and strategies for treatment naive people living with HIV as well as treatment experience people living with uh, HIV. I'm sure we're all familiar with the rationale for new agents and strategies, uh, namely we still have opportunities to improve uh, the, the ART that we deliver to patients despite uh, decades of remarkable improvement. We can still make progress in terms of long-term safety uh, we also know that our patients appreciate uh, taking medications, not uh, that they would having medications that they would not have to take on a daily basis, and maybe that can also improve their adherence. So long-acting therapies continue to be of high interest. And recently, we we've, we've learned, and is now codified that not everybody needs to be on three uh, drugs to have viral suppression. And I think there is an interest in finding a construct that would allow lower antiretroviral uh, burden with two uh, agents also. And of course, there's a population uh, in our clinics that are still uh, in need of new classes because they have become resistant to current uh, therapies or they have intolerance or adverse effects. And so if you look at the pipeline, it's, this is what you'll see. We have a number of agents. Uh, one of them is already FDA approved, called for stem severe, which is a first-in-class attachment inhibitor. And shown also are the different kinds of characteristics that a new agent might introduce and how these available or emerging therapies are contributing to that. So in terms of parenteral long-acting formulation, for stem severe does not achieve that. But it does uh, provide an option for patients who have multidrug-resistant virus. And it's not being looked at in two-drug uh, construct. If you look down, you'll see Zlatrovir and Lenacaprovir both of which are also new agents, and the boxes are checked across the board because these therapies provide all those new additions to our armamentarium. You go down, there's carbotegravir plus rupivirine, which is long-acting, but does not target a multidrug-resistant population, but is being used in two drugs, along with rupivirine. And we have got neutralized antibodies that meet some of the criteria. So you can see that as... Uh, the pipeline is uh, improving, we are beginning to achieve some of those goals that I think will help our patient care overall. Let's start with first time severe. It's a first-in-class attachment inhibitor, which, as you know, uh, binds to HIV GP120. And by doing so, it prevents the conformational change that the virus needs to attach to uh, CD4 cells and gain viral entry. First time severe has been investigated in a phase three clinical trial called the BRIGHT study. And as I mentioned earlier, it's now available uh, for, for use. In the BRIGHT study, uh, participants were highly treatment experienced, and they were so treatment experienced that th they had to be divided into two cohorts. One cohort called the non-randomized cohort uh, included participants that had no uh, remaining class of antiretroviral agents that they could use, whereas the randomized cohort still had maybe uh, one or two classes remaining that they could use. But these were highly treatment experienced patients. And the efficacy of stem severe by itself was demonstrated in the first uh, part of the study where uh, the randomized cohort 
was randomized to either getting placebo or the active drug. And they were able to demonstrate about a 0.79 log drop in virus load from the drug alone. And in the latter part, in the open label part of the study, our patients received for stem severe post optimized background regimen. And what did we see? We saw that in this highly treatment experienced patient with a lot of resistance, if you look at the week 48 data, the randomized cohort uh, was able to achieve about 84% uh, less than, 84% achieve viral load less than 200 copies per meal. And if you look at the non randomized cohort, uh, about 54% achieved viral load less than 200 copies per meal. It's really remarkable for this uh, degree of, of resistance. And, if, and this is the observed cohort, by the way. And if you look on the, the uh, bottom part of the, of the figure, you'll see the improvement in CD4 count uh, going up to 139 uh, in, the in the randomized uh, cohort. This was the group that still had at least uh, a few drugs, or at least one drug that they could combine uh, with their regimen. Through week 96, the results continued to be good, as you can see with viral suppression rate, and CD4 count increased, continued to increase. The randomized cohort increasing ultimately to about 205 cells mean uh, CD4 count, and non-randomized cohort increasing to about 119. CD4-CD8 ratio also increased, showing that even in this highly treatment experience patient, we now have an option uh, for therapy that is a Nobel class, but of course has to be combined with other agents. Important to note that the resistance profile of first stem severe is still being uh, unraveled. What we know for now is that we do not have cross-resistance uh, in major ways to the other classes. We know that tropism of the virus really does not affect it, uh, like it uh, would affect CCR agents that are targeted uh, CCR5 uh, primarily. We also know that there are polymorphisms in GP120 that can affect the susceptibility of first stem severe. But when genotypic testing has been done, it's really not clear how this translates into clinical care. And we don't have a clear uh, answer yet. And phenotypic cutoff is yet to be established. So a lot, of, still, a lot still needs to be learned about the uh, resistance characteristics of stem severe. In terms of food, there are no significant food problems. Drug interaction seems to be okay with the studies done so far, as you can see. Uh, no major signature organ-specific adverse effects to, to be concerned about. And of course, like many of our drugs, we have to wait and learn over time to really characterize fully their metabolic profile. But so far, for stem severe, appears to have a favorable metabolic profile. So this uh, is one drug that we now have as an option uh, for our patients with multidrug resistant HIV. Next, investigational agent that we're going to talk about is Islatrovir. Islatrovir is the first in-class nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor really exciting drug that we've been learning about more and more in the last few years. Here is the structure uh, shown in uh, A in this uh, figure. And B shows you one of the ways in which Islatrovia interferes with DNA elongation. And C just shows that this process of inhibiting DNA elongation can occur immediately, but there's also a delayed part of it. So it's said to have a dual mechanism of action, which is really uh, quite exciting. This characteristic contributes significantly to its high potency, as you can see here, with just a whiff of the medication, 0.5 milligrams, are resulting in more than a log decline in HIV RNA by day seven. If you put that in context, you know that many of our drugs are those that you know, 50 milligrams, 300 milligrams, etc. But this is just 0.5 milligrams, showing this remarkable virus decay. Yeah. And in terms of its intracellular half-life, this is another property of it that is quite exciting with a half-life of about uh, 78 to 128 uh, hours uh, intracellularly. Now, the triphosphate is the active intracellular form, and the concentration of that form in cells is about a 1,000 times higher than the concentration of Islatrovir in plasma. So here is another drug that concentrates in cells. We do have a little bit of clinical information from study 011, in which patients were randomized to uh, four doses of Islatrovir, 0.25, 0.75, and 2.25 milligrams of Islatrovir. And each of these groups received the combination of Doravirin and 3TC uh, for until viral suppression occurred. After viral suppression occurred, the 3TC was withdrawn. And so what you're seeing here are the efficacy results. While patients were on a two-drug regimen of Islatrovir plus Doravirin using different doses of Islatrovir. All these this different uh, groups were compared to Doravirin 3TC TDF as the standard of care. And as you can see, there was good virologic response across our board. 
and uh, virologic failure was uncommon. In fact, uh, the few participants that had virologic failure uh, did not have viral load over 80 copies per mil. So in this uh, study in which Islatrabia was used as a two-drug construct, it showed real uh, promise. There was no resistance uh, reported because no virus or no patient, no participant failed with viral load higher enough for you to do resistance testing. But we know from in vitro data that when you subject, well, when you expose virus to Islatrabia for a long time, you can have uh, M1A4B mutation is the main thing that can reduce susceptibility. But if you try to put that in clinical context, this has really no, no impact on clinical susceptibility. And hypersusceptibility has been demonstrated with some of the mutants that we're familiar with. And here is the key take-home message, that Islatrovir is more potent in vitro against NRTI-resistant variants than our usual NRTIs are against wild-type HIV. This is quite remarkable. And to date, we have not, demo- we have not uh, recorded resistance in a treated patient. Of course, only a handful of patients have been treated. I think we'll learn more as we go on. But there's no doubt that we have a, it has a good, uh, robust resistance uh, barrier. No problems with food. We know a little bit about drug interactions with dolotegravir, with the um, contraceptives, doraverine, uh, et cetera, and there are no major issues, but again, we need to, to learn more. All kinds of specific adverse effects with dyslatrovir. What I keep uh, keeping my eyes out for is headache. Now, this is by no means a signature side effect of it uh, for now, but I, I've, it's been reported in uh, some trials uh, enough for, for us to, to at least uh, you know, keep our eyes uh, open. I think time will tell whether this is something uh, to, to worry about or not. Metabolic profile, we're just beginning to learn about it. There's really so far no evidence that it has any mitochondrial toxicity or any significant effect on DNA methylation, so that looks promising. In terms of what is being done with it now, there are five trials under the umbrella of Illuminate trials looking at Islatrovir, 0.75 milligrams plus Dorabin, 100 milligrams. And this is being looked at across the treatment continuum. We do not have any data uh, yet uh, in a large context, but I think these studies will be coming out uh, in the near future and hope we all uh, eagerly are with them. This is just to remind you that Islatrovir, Islatrovir is also being looked at for PrEP. And in this study, it was able to maintain adequate levels of PrEP uh, for at least for a year when given as an implant. The next drug is lenacaprovir, which is a GS6207, the first in class cap- capsid inhibitor. Very interesting uh, drug. As you all know, uh, the capsid is this protein cone like structure that really surrounds the two strands of RNA in the uh, HIV genome. And it's critical to multiple functions of the virus from entry through, uh, through replication. And if it is incapacitated, as Lencaprovia does, through multiple steps, what you have is really what I'll describe as a castrated virus that, that is really uh, ineffective. And so this very interesting compound uh, is very potent. As you can see, a single intra- uh, subcutaneous dose resulted in substantial, uh, quite remarkable uh, log reduction in virus load up to about 2.3 uh, in, in some cases. And not only is it highly potent, uh, it was actually demo- it was designated by the FDA as a breakthrough uh, drug because it really meets many uh, of the needs that we have in, in HIV, including the, the, the um, ability to be administered as a long-acting formulation, which was just reported at the virtual IAS a few weeks uh, ago in which a single 900 milligram dose of uh, lencaprovir was shown to be maintain adequate levels for 26 weeks, which is what is going to be uh, looked for. In terms of resistance, it also has robust resistance uh, characteristics showing that it is active against strains that are resistant to classes now. Why? That's because it has a different mechanism of action and has different multiple uh, steps that it can incapacitate the capsid uh, function. Uh, some concerns about cleavage, uh, about uh, GAD cleavage site mutations have been totally uh, resolved because it really does not, its, its efficacy is not affected by polymorphisms in uh, these sites, whether they occur after exposure to produce inhibitors or that they're naturally occurring. Uh, this really does not have any effect on its, uh, on its activity. So again, very robust resistance profile. 
And what do we know clinically? Well, we know for now that food has no effect on it, so that is good. It can be given orally, but also can be given parenterally, as we've described, and dosed every uh, six months. We know that uh, drug interactions, we're just learning about that. Organ-specific adverse effects, we're just learning about that. And metabolic, again, time will tell. Planned trials are quite robust. And here again is another drug that is being looked at in a two-drug construct, uh, construct. It will be looked at in combination with have FTC orally, and then after viral suppression, subcutaneously administered lencaprevir plus TAF or bitegravir, and also uh, another study that we'll be looking at, and also looking at it compared to uh, oral uh, TAF and uh, FTC and big TAF FTC. There's also a study that will look at it in treatment experience patients, again, showing that this is an agent that will be investigated across the treatment uh, continuum, but we do not have uh, the data yet uh, for it. Next, we'll talk about carbotegravir plus ropivirin, which is clearly uh, going to be uh, the first uh, full parenterally administered antiretroviral regimen. Uh, this has been studied in three clinical trials, FLARE, ATLAS, and ATLAS 2M. The FLARE study enrolled treatment-naive participants who, after suppression uh, with dotegravir, abacavir, 3CC, were randomized to their regimen or uh, the acute uh, four-week dosing of this, of this agent. In ATLAS, Virologically suppressed participants were given this uh, regimen or continuation of their uh, oral regimen. And based on uh, some confidence from Latte too, that uh, the Q8 week dosing could be fine, Atlas 2 m was conducted in which uh, this, this uh, regimen was looked at as a Q4 week versus Q8 week uh, regimen. And what was consistent throughout is that there was non inferiority demonstrated against the, the comparator uh, in all of these studies. And biologic failure was very uh, uncommon across the studies. There are some questions about what accounts for biologic failure. Can you predict biologic failure if you're given a patient uh, intramuscular carbotegravir plus uh, intramuscular ropivirin? And now there's the, there are many factors that have been uh, brought up as, as potential uh, culprits. None of them uh, stands out as one that one can point a finger to per se. It's likely to be multifactorial and vary from patient to patient. But well, this is something that uh, there's a lot of interest in. Yet, overall, there's robust uh, evidence that, that it's good for uh, the overwhelming majority of patients. Now, resistance did emerge to NNRTI and integrase inhibitors in some patients following biologic failure. And in some of these patients, you could actually track back and see that there were pre-existing mutations found in the PBMCs, meaning, uh, and how this will impact clinical care is of, of significant uh, interest. We should know that we are in a world now that we've become quite averse to resistance of any kind, given the experience that we have with Bictagravir and Dolotagravir in clinical trials. So when we see resistance, even if it's a, a small amount, we, we take note of it. Our patients who have participated in trials of this combination have uh, loved it, uh, as you can see here, showing high satisfaction rate, very low discontinuation rate, less than 1% in the clear trials. And when patients have had the option of taking it every four weeks or every eight weeks, they have, in general, uh, supported, preferred the Q8 uh, week uh, option. And as you can see uh, as well, the injection site reactions are quite uh, common uh, in these patients, seeing about almost 30% of all uh, injections. But again, withdrawal as a result of adverse effects are being uh, very uncommon. Lendronilimab, uh, Pro-140 is a drug that has been available uh, for quite uh, a long time. And now, if you're counting, it's probably been about 15 years since Lendronilimab has been, has been around. Uh, we don't know how this will end. Last year, there was uh, a report by the FDA. Uh, there was a submission of, uh, some, of, of some of the reports, partial reports uh, to, the, to the FDA. And uh, I personally haven't heard much about it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a humanized uh, antibody against CD4. It's supposed to be given every week or every, every other week. And it's been tested in different, uh, different uh, groups of, of patients and even been considered for use in patients who have cancer, GVHD, and, and COVID-19. And where this drug will, will end up is unclear, uh, but it's worth uh, keeping it uh, on the list here so that at least you are aware uh, of it. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about the broadly neutralizing antibodies, which are 
are naturally are producing. We know that if you took an HIV-infected patient, you'll be able to isolate uh, BNAPs of different kinds in, 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 in patients. And we know that some of these BNAPs do have neutralizing uh, potential, generally with a half-life of about two to five weeks, and they can uh, produce about 1.5 log uh, reduction. I think that it's a general uh, thought that the potency uh, that we ascribe to these BNAPs may not be as great as, as they are when you look at them clinically, but against one of the things that at time we tell. But like many drugs, we know that if you administer broadly neutralizing antibodies as monotherapy, it's a matter of time before the virus becomes a resistant to it. Therefore, a monotherapy uh, is not, a, is not a, the way forward. Combination approaches have been looked at. And uh, another potential advantage of DNAPs is that they may, beyond their effects on viral uh, suppression or maintenance of viral suppression, they can, I uh, hope, they may be able to engage the immune system and provide some immune-specific advantages, which, again, we, it's something that uh, will be specific to the, to the BNAP. And one of the more exciting uh, developments is the emergence of BNAPs that are multi-specific. And the one that I'll just point out uh, is the one that has been studied in the ACTG 5377, uh, which is the SAR441236 uh, molecule that is tri-specific. It's able to uh, bind to the HIV at different uh, sites, the CD4 binding sites, the B1, B1, B2 uh, site, and the uh, proximal external uh, region. And the binding at these different sites, the, the idea is that it can uh, maybe clear virus better and improve efficacy and maybe simplify treatment regimen instead of giving multiple drugs. This single drug, because it has multiple specificities to bind and clear virus, uh, can be a, a form of uh, monotherapy. One attribute of uh, many of the BNAPs that's, that's quite promising is that not only are they being looked at as, uh, not only are they able to be used in two drug combination, maybe they will need to be used in more, but it's the half-life of the compounds. Uh, by making some minor amino acid uh, modifications, the half-lives of BNAPs can be tremendously uh, changed. And so this LS configuration that you see here that's quite common with many of the BNAPs really is uh, leucine and serine. And what that does, it, it actually prevents, it delays the clearance of these uh, antibodies uh, from systemic circulation, which, uh, of course, has obvious therapeutic uh, advantages. And so I'll conclude uh, with this take-home point, that one, we have several investigational agents uh, in, in our hands. Uh, I mentioned uh, many of them. One of the characteristics is that they have not just one, but dual, even multiple mechanisms of action. We talked uh, about these being the case for Islatrovir, and also this being the case for Venkapravir. They also have unique resistance uh, profile, allowing them to be active against drugs, against strains that are resistant to uh, currently available uh, NRTIs, NNRTIs, integrase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. And again, that is true for Islatrovir and also for Lencaprovir. Uh, not all the uh, agents that we're uh, looking at now I really make that uh, no new and, and important standard. The uh, agents have also uh, kept alive this potential for two-drug regimens, as I described the, the studies looking at it for uh, Cabotegravir, Ropivirin is a two-drug regimen, um, the Lencaprovir, uh, subcutaneous blood TAF, or, or, or Bitegravir is a two-drug regimen, uh, Duravirin plus its latrovir, 0.75 milligrams, a two-drug regimen. So this is something that we're seeing uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pipeline. The long-acting formulations is really uh, a big deal with uh, many of the agents being available in long-acting formulations. As you can see, latrovir and lenacaprovir are the most remarkable, uh, of course, in terms of treatment uh, for now is lenacaprovir, which can be given uh, subcutaneously every six months. And, of course, the BNABs uh, with the LS uh, formation or conformational uh, change, amino acid change, uh, can really prolong the half-life. And carbotegravir plus rupivirin, which can be or will be available either as a four-week uh, dosing or maybe a, a eight-week uh, administration, and has been shown uh, in, in the, the Atlas 2M studies to be, to be equivalent. I'm sure you'll hear more about this uh, when Dr. Iron uh, makes his presentation. Carbotegravir plus rupivirin is an advanced stage of development uh, note that this is only for patients who are biologically suppressed. Uh, there have not been studies conducted in patients who are viremic to see whether uh, it's, uh, we don't know about that yet. It's really been studied in patients who have achieved biologic suppression prior to switch to this regimen. 
some agents is Latrovia and then Caprovia have been investigated in treatment naive and treatment experienced patients. And I think what they add really is what I mentioned before that they have a new uh, mechanism of action that allow them to be used in patients who have failed a range of, of regimens and maybe their long acting potential can offer some adherence advantages. And finally, for stem severe, uh, which is available only in oral formulation, was recently FDA approved for treatment experience patients with multidrug resistant virus who have failed uh, multiple regimens. And uh, the results of the BRIGHT study, as I shared with you, uh, through week 96 was very robust in terms of biologic uh, outcomes in this uh, particular population, CD4 count that continue to increase uh, through week 96 and uh, implement the CD4, CD8 count. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Bobogin back as we move to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taiwo. It was a, a great summary of, of really exciting new, uh, new agents, some of which look like they're uh, really coming pretty rapidly and into the approval um, uh, uh, shoot, if you will. Um, so great. And I'll remind the audience uh, that if you uh, have questions, uh, I hope you do. Um, uh, uh, please uh, enter them in the Q&A um, uh, uh, feature on, on Zoom. Um, maybe while we wait for, for the audience to ask questions, I'll, I have a couple that, um, uh, that I jotted down. Uh, so FOS, uh, uh, Temsevere is available now. It's approved. Uh, talk about how you might imagine right away incorporating it into your, into your practice. Where do you see that being used which, with, with which other agents, do you think? Yeah, it's really used in patients who have very treatment experience, who have failed uh, multiple regimens in general. It's the way that it's approved. It's approved in patients who cannot, uh, who need new therapies based on resistance, uh, treatment to- intolerance, or safety concerns. I usually would combine it with either ibanezumab, which, as you know, is another intravenous, uh, is an intravenous agent given every two weeks, or, uh, well, not and, in most cases, a uh, boosted PI or dolutegravir. It could be usually one of those, one, two, or more, depending on the patient resistance profile. Ever so rarely, there will be uh, some NR- NRTI combination that I would also add uh, for reasons that we, we, we know in terms of you know, using these agents, even when there is um, genotypic resistance uh, to, to them. It depends, again, on the context. But it's really for the patient who's been through quite a lot of medications. Super. Uh, there's another question um, people are interested, obviously, in the, in the long-acting CAB, uh, real pivoting uh, formulation. Uh, you mentioned uh, that it was resubmitted to the FDA Tell us a little bit about what happened, why it was uh, why it was bounced uh, back a little bit at first, and uh, when we expect to hear uh, whether it's actually going to be available um, with FDA. Right. I think we all thought it would be approved by the end of last year, but that was deferred mainly because of some issues with manufacturing and and related issues. There's nothing to do with the efficacy. I think that's what people need to be to be assured about that the results of FLAIR of, of ATLAS and ATLAS 2N really confirm that this is a promising strategy and reports from patients show it's wanted is, is important. I think the, the delay is due related to, to things other than that. Now, in terms of when it will be available, I wish I had the crystal ball. I think what I've heard is that it should be hopefully sometime this year, maybe the latter part of this year or, or, or early next year. I really i uh, am not sure. But I know that the resubmissions have, have taken place and uh, I believe the assumptions have taken place, and we just keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, I think one of the most encouraging things that you showed was that the p- people that were on the uh, long-acting injectables really liked it a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I might have expected going into it, I don't like needles, uh, that, that maybe people would find that a, an objection, but apparently it's, uh, uh, it's not. Yeah, people say that people uh, that participants in those trials were patients who wanted to be on the injection. So there was some pre-selection yeah. of, of that. Uh, but again, that's what's going to happen in clinical practice. You're not right. going to give it to somebody who does not want it. So I think the pop- participant population reflects the patients who will be getting it. So I, I divide the world into patients, patient world into those who like it, who will like it, and those who will not. And I think it's going to be hard to move the patient from one basket to the other basket. But I think there will be enough interest in it 
Yeah, uh, and and I've I've got a couple of patients who do a lot of traveling, and I think or used to, <laughs> uh, right? COVID. Yeah. Um, and I think for for them, uh, it's going to be a really an interesting uh, option not to have to pack uh, large amounts of pills and worry about disclosure and and the rest. Uh, some more questions we have. So you maybe already answered this one, but one question was: How do you decide between? Uh, ibolizumab and fostemsevir, um, and I think what you said already is that you may very well use them together. Exactly. Yeah, because the patients who need these drugs really need a lot of help. And and since there's no limit on the number of drugs that you, you give, it depends on, on what they are, but it, it's a patient uh, issue. Ibolizumab has to be given intravenously every two weeks. So that's an issue if a patient cannot or does not want to come. To the clinic, so that that's something might might uh, triage a patient in one way or the other. There's really no way to pre-test to say, okay, I've done some tests and I, this patient is susceptible to first temp severe. I'm going to give or ebolizumab. I think that future hopefully is not too far, uh, but they've been used together quite often. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite people, Vicky Johnson. Hi, Vicky. Uh, says. Um, why does uh, why does uh, cabotegravir require deep IM injection, and what about the possibility that it might be used in um, uh, in pharmacies uh, instead of having to come to the to the HIV clinic itself? Right, there's a lot of talk about the implementation part of this, and I think that's the potential barrier to wide adoption. So, administration at sites other than clinics is is something that the, the, the community wants, and providers also want. Whether it will happen or not, there's so many. Um, structural issues that have to be overcome. But I agree with Dr. Johnson that it would be great if this could be given in places other than a, clinical, a clinic setting. People have even talked about home administration. And you can imagine um, if a person who's, uh, if you had a, a partner who's a nurse, <laughs> should be able to give yeah. you the, the injection. Patients give themselves testosterone uh, at home. And so the, there's so many uh, the discussions going on to, to figure out whether this will be possible. And in terms of the deep intramuscular injection, you do have to give into the gluteus medius. And, and uh, that, that, I think, is important. Uh, and I think each clinic will have to think about how to, to make sure that they have personnel that, that do this well. And, and uh, over time, it will become, uh, I think, part of our routine uh, care. And I think I can find my maximus, but I'm not sure about my media. <laughs> but uh, I guess we'll all <laughs> learn the anatomy uh, as, we, as we do this. Um, another another p- participant um, who uh, discloses himself as HIV positive says it's it's really um, uh, nice to the long acting because the, the days that you don't have to take pills are days that you don't have to remember or be reminded that you're HIV um, infected. So I think that's a, a powerful message. That, uh, that yeah, we- absolutely. I I, I totally uh, I acknowledge that that is true, especially if you give it every every. Two months, that's only six injections uh, a year. And I think COVID has even taught us that even in the very, in very difficult circumstances, that you can actually continue to provide uh, care uh, and, and maintain suppression uh, using intramuscular agents and maybe combined with the oral agent if you needed to, to have a uh, temporary uh, change. So another question um, is uh, what... You know, this is a little bit crystal ball um, with these agents that are being approved. But uh, the question is about uh, lenacapavir. Uh, what do you imagine being used a- along with it? Uh, how, how do you see its uh, position again in the... In right. The- so we have to go through clinical trials that are going on now, that plant, in which it will be used. The, there are two formulations. There's the oral formulation that, of course, you can combine with other oral agents. But the most powerful one is the sub- the subcute formulation that you can give every six months. Unfortunately, we don't have an agent to pair that uh, with, and so the studies will be combining the subcutaneous formulation with oral tap, with oral bitegravir. So it doesn't really take you away from that daily regimen construct. I hope that in the future, we may be able to combine this long acting and caprivir with some of the broad neutralizing antibodies. We are thinking about a study that might look at that, like which, is what, which is the best broad neutralized antibody to combine Subcutaneous than a caprovir uh, with, and who knows? I mean, it's latrovir right now. It's going to be we're talking about the oral formulation, and the other formulations are for for prep. But I'm not sure that uh, it's been looked at for for that duration uh, right now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Another question, uh, when starting an initial regimen and waiting viral resistance, uh, this whole rapid start, which we'll get back to later in the program, I think, with Joe Aaron's cases, um, might you use fostemsevir in that setting, uh, given the lack of, uh, of resistance uh, that we see in the community? Right. That's been, it's, it's, it's been discussed, it's crossed uh, people's minds, uh, but I think that we have a lot of robust uh, agents in that space already. Uh, that I'm not sure. The main challenge I have with that is that for stem severe is twice a day, it's BID. And so I would not, I think that our patients, if you ask them to take a drug twice a day now, they'll say, why? My friend is taking a drug once a day. Why do I take, why do I need to take it BID? So I think that will make it very unattractive for initial, initial therapy. Got it, got it. Um, so uh, you mentioned the Eslatrovir um, implant um, that I think another really potentially exciting direction. Tell, have you had experience with the implant? What does it look like? How is it, how is it given? How invasive is it? Well, this implant had to be given, it had to be implanted surgically. So it had to be implanted surgically around the shoulder area, uh, but, and it has to be surgically removed. So that is, that's a major limitation. But if you could do that and have it in for a year, that might, you might be able to you know, consider that. In this study that I showed, it was for PrEP. So they were looking at this ability to maintain levels sufficient for PrEP. It's not the same as levels needed for treatment. And so I'm not sure that we can, it, it can be extrapolated to mean that you know, it can be used for, for treatment. That was a PrEP-related uh, slide. Great. And uh, another uh, audience member points out that uh, the, the uh, company that makes Slatrovir is looking at it at once-month oral dosing for, for PrEP as well. So another another. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be interesting to see all the different options for prep, and I, I'm sure Susan Buckbinder uh, later in the program will will be talking uh, more about this. But it's 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 becoming really, I think, one of the most vibrant parts of our of, of the HIV um, uh, drugs. It should be right if we can prevent new infections. Then, then I think that helps uh, everybody. So, and I, I tend to think of monoclonals. Um, and, uh, and, and as, um, perhaps very costly, is, is there a sense of, of what, um, Loranomab, for example, uh, might cost if it's approved? Is it, is it uh, difficult to make? Yeah, I don't know how it might, um, how much that would cost, but you're right that it's really the production of BNAP is a big deal. It takes it, it takes a lot to produce it, and to produce it in mass quantities is also also a challenge. But I think that technology of today is what we're talking about. We don't know what we're going to have you know, two years or five years to to meet that 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 challenge. But compared to say generic you know three TC, it's uh, it's it's vastly different. So another question going back to your uh, uh, medius. Um, uh, site reactions with the with the uh, cab um and and then another question uh, with that drug uh, combination is the need for an oral lead-in uh, if we're starting to think about using it in uh, in uh, patients that are viremic. Right. So in terms of injection site reactions, pain was certainly the most uh, most common one. And initially, every, well, not everyone, but a lot, well over half of patients, 70, 80 percent initially would report some degree, usually low grade, not incapacitating, last a few days. And critically, interruption or discontinuation of treatment because of that, like I said, was very, very uh, uncommon. And so it's really not uh, not not a, a big a big a big issue, really. Super. Um, we are out of time, uh, Dr. Taiwo. Thank you very much. That was a that was a great review of of a, of a sometimes complicated field to, to, to talk about. So I appreciate your teaching. Thank uh, and I'll turn it back to uh, Connie Benson uh, to uh, continue on with the program.